Hello, and welcome to Alcohol Free Radio. I'm your host, Chris Becker, and I'm excited to have you join us. Whether you are new to the amazing and growing alcohol free community or someone who is already familiar, we hope you enjoy our program. This is where you can hear from some people making a real difference, whether as brewers or producers of amazing beverages, influencers in the community, authors, storytellers, and more. We aim to break it down and bring it all together. Our goal is simple, to build awareness about this great community and to help make alcohol free, fun, easy, and tasting great. So here we go, enjoy. Hi everyone, Chris Becker here, and this episode is a new and an interesting one I hope in terms of format, we will be doing more of. Uh, I had the pleasure to spend some time with Jillian Fontana here in our showroom talking about all things alcohol-free wine. Um, it's a very popular segment, even though it's one that people tend to know less about compared to, say, beer and uh, ready-to-drinks and some other categories, but nevertheless is super popular and uh, a lot of great and innovative things happening. So Jillian is a, is a small A with plenty of experience in restaurants and wine selections as well as a consultant. So got to talk about alcohol free from the from an industry perspective and then also tasted a range of five or six and I'll I'll leave it to the episode where we'll talk about uh, and show some of the ones we tasted uh, as well. So hope you enjoy. Take care. Hi, this is Chris and uh, welcome to this episode of Alcohol Free Radio. I'm very excited to introduce Jillian Fontana, who's here with me live uh, in studio here in our showroom. Um, Jillian is a sommelier with experience in some of the top restaurants in New York and Boston, so right here mm -hmm. in the Northeast. Uh, over 15 years of experience in mm -hmm. hospitality, and more recently is a consultant and uh, curates uh, in-home and other event-based uh, tastings and others with all kinds of uh, different groups and, and institutions so um, and private and curates private collections so first of all welcome and thank thanks you for coming. thank you for having me we've been excited to have Jillian as well starting to get involved in some of our tasting so we want to talk about a couple of things one is just the general uh, industry alcohol free and wine how do these connect and we'll talk a bit more about that but not uh, skip over some tastings as well uh, of, of some actual alcohol-free wines and get some, some thoughts and some expertise and some opinions from a real live expert. So we're excited to uh, tackle both of those things today. Yeah, I'm excited to be here. Good. Yeah. So um, a couple of things just to start. Uh, you know, we here at Better Roads are often just immersed in the alcohol-free space and sometimes probably think that it's a topic maybe of more on more more on people's tongues than 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 is actually true what's mm -hmm. the how well known is alcohol free in in the wine industry or in the mm -hmm. Somalia community i think it really depends on the demographic that we're speaking about so within the restaurant world right now alcohol free beverages are super hot right and all of the top restaurants have had mocktail programs for years now okay. um, in the in the top restaurants that are at the cutting edge of the bartending game and the wine scene they've been doing mocktails for for the past few years but it hasn't necessarily trickled down to all restaurants now when we're talking about demographics outside of the hospitality industry i definitely think the younger um, generation z and millennials yeah. are much more familiar and comfortable with this product category than the little bit older more mature generation um, and i've certainly experienced that talking to my cousins who are even a little bit younger than me and then talking to my parents and my grandparents are certainly less aware of these products it's exciting, though, to share them with people who haven't tried them yet and see their reactions. Cool. Um, is kind of taking that a step further within the restaurant industry, within mm -hmm. the wine industry, um, you know, I've, I've had some conversations with folks mm -hmm. in, the, in the media or some of the authors uh, that we've, we've, we've been lucky enough to meet with some of the books that are in this space. Um, you know, some of the, what's, what's the flavor? Is there a debate um, mm -hmm. around, does alcohol free, is it legit? Does it have a place in, mm -hmm. in the wine community? Um, and, you know, who have you met in your travels and to the extent that that's come up? Can you give us yeah. a bit of a feel for any of those sure. conversations? Sure, well, certainly there is a place for de-alcoholized wines in the wine community. 
Part of that is because these products were wine with alcohol right. initially. Right, right, so right. that's important. It's not just grape juice that's being put into a bottle and put on the shelf. These are products that were carefully uh, vinified wines that were then gone through another process to remove the alcohol. Right. So this is a that's product a that ju has just as much potential nuance as regular wines that contain alcohol, which is exciting because from variety to variety, there will be differences in the AF wines just as there are in traditionally made wines. Okay. And have you seen in, you know, you mentioned in the mm -hmm. restaurants or in your community, your fellow Psalms or other mm -hmm. folks. Um, so a couple that we've talked to or yeah. in talking to some authors, they were intimations that there are cliques probably too, cliques strong, probably too strong a word, mm -hmm. but some folks are like, no, that's right. not, it's not. I have encountered not, that. Okay. I have encountered that. So certainly, um, I've met some people who I've asked sort of in the industry, what's your take on this? Just to see um, what their thoughts are. And very quickly, some people will shoot it down and say, oh no, that's a joke, or no, that's disgusting, or something really horrible. And then there's a <laughs> lot of people, though, who are really into it um, and are excited about it and see that it is more than just a trend. It's just, right. it's an emerging category that's going to be here to stay, no, yeah. but no matter what. Well, and as you said, yeah. it's already kind of changed uh, I, we think of like when it comes to alcohol free mm -hmm. wine or wine product, like if you think in New York City, you can go into a grocery store, you can't get wine or alcohol free right. wine, but you can get the wine product. Yes. It's often grape juice. Yes. That was like yes. first gen. And yeah. now I think we're in the second gen mm -hmm. where we've got some good uh, wineries mm -hmm. and, and some pure play alcohol free uh, wineries that where they're, it, it, it is a wine, and then it's gone through some sort of dealkalization mm -hmm. process. And there's a few. We won't get into the details of the various mm -hmm. techniques today. Um, and then it'll be interesting to see with what com what comes next as the as the demand grows. Um, there is, you know, with all that said, mm -hmm. um, I you know some people might be coming to this to say, oh, wine alcohol free, that's the best of both worlds. Right. Going to get the wine, opening mm -hmm. the wine, ready to taste the wine. Yeah. I don't think I'm saying anything out of turn when I say there is a taste difference here. Yes. Do you want to talk a bit about that? And we'll yeah. come back to it when we actually yeah. do some of the tasting. Sure. Well, I'll talk about my own experience. Sure. The first few times that I tried some of the products that are on the market, I didn't know at all what to expect. And I did it the proper way as a sommelier would. I had it in my wine glass and I'm swirling and I'm smelling like, oh, okay, this is a little different. Take a taste that I'm like... Oh, this is not this is not wine, right? right? So there were certainly moments where I was like, okay, this is not what I expected. But I also tried many products and started to realize that there is so much potential. Because of the different products that I was trying, they would get better and better and better. Every every time I would taste some new products, there are certain improvements that I was noticing in the quality. Okay. And in these improvements, they were much closer to a traditionally made wine. So definitely moving in the right direction in terms of the techniques and the technology that's being used to preserve the flavors and the aromas that we love in yes. wine. Uh, yes, that's really interesting. Mm -hmm. And um, I think you know we're seeing this in some of the other categories, whether it's beer or what have you, um, where now that the industry can kind of look and say, you know, if they thought it was a fad mm -hmm. or if they thought it was always going to be a subculture or a mm -hmm. subsegment, to the extent that it's showing some pretty healthy growth, mm -hmm. customers and rest, you know, restaurant goers are, are asking, mm -hmm. which means yes. restaurant owners are hearing. Yes. And I think the, you know, there's opportunities for them too if they're offering a wider selection of alcohol-free mm -hmm. options that they might be able to sell on their menu exactly. as opposed to you know, offering a, a water, which right. is totally fine, but it's mm -hmm. obviously uh, something that a restaurant might, owner might want to see as an opportunity exactly. um, that there's more coming mm -hmm. coming from that. I'll ask you a selfish question because we known each other not very long, but mm -hmm. I've had a chance to uh, come together, taste a few different mm -hmm. wines. We're going to do more of that today uh, as part of the show. Before you and you know one of the friends of Better mm -hmm. Roads, George Bresnitz, who was uh, nice enough to introduce us, before you had talked about it with George or before you knew about Better Rose, mm -hmm. kind of more from a, a virgin standpoint, mm -hmm. what, what was your exposure at that point, Extremely if you can recall? Extremely limited. Okay. Extremely limited. And I also came off recently of having two children. So right. I was at a point where I was pregnant, 
And I didn't really know about these products. Now, this is going back four or five years. So right. this was really, I think, and you know better than me, but before this really started to gain a yeah. lot of traction. But I was going to the grocery store and being very hot over the summer and just like wanting a beer. <laughs> like, I just want a beer. And I would, you know, find one of those old name beers, non-alcoholic beers. Yeah. And I'd be like, this one's okay. And I would have just one and it kind of hit the spot, but it wasn't really doing it for me. So... That's all I knew yeah. several years ago, okay. um, and I was very much immersed, really, in the in the wine world, and and that's you know that was it. Yeah, so. and it's not and really I kind yeah, of there I naturally. Know. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'd like to at some point we'll come back to some of the things mm -hmm. where this conversation can continue in terms of the trends, and mm -hmm. you were starting to allude to it, but now might be a good time to stop and go through a few of the wines that. Sure. Uh, we've selected out of a lot, so we, mm -hmm. we had a chance to go through and pick a few. Some um, we've been, you know, we've tried for a while, and some are a bit newer, but yes. you've had a chance yes. to try them before the show. So yes. uh, with that, why don't we pick a few, okay. and I'll ask you to tell us what we're talking about, okay. anything in terms of background, and then a taste and some background. Okay, so this is the, and, and you can certainly supplement anything I may not know. Um, so this is the Naughty, it's a, a sparkling Chardonnay. And this is made in Spain? Yes. Is that correct? And, and de-alcoholized in Germany. In Germany, okay. From Thompson & Scott, so our, our good friend Amanda Thompson has really innovated in the sparkling wine space and doing well in, in North America, really around the world. Look at that fizz there. That's really nice. So this is one of my, one of my faves, if I, must, if I may say so. Um, I'm a huge champagne fan. And champagne comes from France, so I drink champagne. But when budget does not allow, I'll go to Cava <laughs> or Cremant, something else that's not quite as pricey. We won't tell the Spanish or Italians. <laughs> so the nose here is gorgeous. It is so reminiscent of true champagne, right. which is very yeasty because right. it's aged um, on a yeast and it imparts that flavor. This really smells. I mean, if blind, I, I would have no idea that this had no alcohol. It's nice and dry, very well balanced, nice, super bright acidity. This can be paired with anything. Yeah. Honestly, I'm gonna go as far to say that like a braised meat, you could even do something that you would think of a red wine. Okay. Champagne can handle it, as can this. So it has the body, it has the acidity, the bubbles give it even a little bit extra to hold up to the richness of that type of dish, so. That's great. This is great. Yeah, and it's also, I mean, as I said, it's uh, it's well positioned, oh, and yeah. we certainly have a lot of customers at Better Roads that love love naughty. If there's one thing you're going to get, this would be the the most versatile in terms of pairing. Yes, I often gift that mm -hmm. one. Yeah. Uh, for people that maybe haven't mm -hmm. uh, haven't uh, tasted any before, and thank you to Andrew, who's our <laughs> customer experience lead, who behind the scenes here is helping us with our. <laughs> with our setups. All right, so this is Pinot's, right? So yes. this is a spritz, virgin spritz. So this is modeled after an Aperol spritz, which is a super popular drink in Europe and it's become actually super fashionable here in the States as well. So the base flavor is supposed to um, emulate Aperol, which is a red right. liqueur, which is you know bitter and a blend of herbs and spices. And it's good for the stomach too. So you can have it after or, be or before. So yeah, again, those, um, gosh, very typical um, Aperol aromas. A little sweet, like a little sweet cherry on the nose, yes. but you get a, a strong um, herbal backbone to it as well. So this is a little bit sweeter compared to the first one we tried. Not, I wouldn't call it very sweet, but it has a little bit more sugar in it. Nice fizz. Refreshing, a little bit orangey okay. flavors, citrus, but like orange citrus. This would be great as you're hanging out, waiting around to have your main meal. Great with hors d'oeuvres, little bites, charcuterie for sure. Delicious. Really cool. So Love thank it. you for that. I, yeah. I like that one too. Yeah. We are, uh, that's a sneak preview for uh, those of you listening. By the time this is out, uh, we may be looking to carry it. That's from Austria, Austria, mm -hmm. and not yet available in North America. It's gonna go. It's gonna go. It's so delicious. All right. So now let's move. Let's take a little step back here. So we have. Um, this is actually 
You, some of you may be familiar with this. This is Geisen. They make Sauvignon Blanc from New Zealand. So here it is again. They just remove the alcohol. So on the nose, if I did not know, again, I would totally guess this as being a Sauvignon Blanc. It has that ripe grapefruit, gooseberry aroma that we associate to be very unique to the Sauvignon Blanc varietal. Very dry, light to medium body, not super light. It actually has some body okay. to it. Yeah. Can definitely hold up to a lot of different foods. Yeah, really nice. Super bright acidity, nice finish at the end. If you're a Sauvignon Blanc lover, a right. lot of people are, this is great. This yeah. is very, very close to the real deal. Okay, and not as many, mm -hmm. uh, for in that part of, you know, in terms of Sauvignon Blancs, mm -hmm. not as many that we've seen compared to some of the other categories, mm -hmm. so that's really interesting. And, yeah. you know, based on what I think the feedback and also uh, the popularity that we've seen, that's mm -hmm. a really popular one. Yeah, delicious. Okay, I'm gonna keep going here. All right, so we're gonna move into rosé. So this is a rosé of Tempranillo, Aldea is the brand. Um, so this is a Spanish style rosé, rosado. That's how they would call it in Spanish. So Tempranillo is the grape. If you've ever had Rioja, Tempranillo is the grape okay. that's used in making Rioja wine. Oh, okay. But instead of being a red, it's a rosé, which means that the grapes were in contact with the juice for a very short time. Okay. So the grapes contain the pigmentation. So when the grapes are in contact with the juice, that's how you get a red wine. If it's a very short amount of time, you have a rosé. Okay. So that's how this is made. Hmm. Gotta get the full experience here. So this is, um, this is really interesting. This is one we're evaluating and it's yeah. a bit newer. This to me is more, and I, this is for me unusual for, um, for a Tempranillo or for a Rosé. A little bit more on the side of apple, quince, that kind of fruit style. Okay. Rather than like a strawberry or a cherry. So it took me back a little bit because I was expecting something different. So we have some apple aromas but there's also a spice, like a spice box component, which is actually really common in, in a lot of the Spanish reds. Okay. So there's sort of a and backbone is, of spice here. Is that part of the fermentation process or is that something they're doing? Well, I don't know if this is added in this case. Yeah, Usually wondering. when we're talking about wines, this is just all natural in the grapes. Each grape has its own Depending on you know, so many things. individuality and, and aromas and all of that. Um, and then also the vinification can have um, a role in the, you know, the taste. Okay. I don't know if there's oak on here. I don't think so. Nice body here, medium body. This can go with lots of different meats, like a pork roast would be great with this. You've got to make this a weekly show. This is fun. <laughs> like this week, selections. And I can just keep drinking. I don't have to spit. <laughs> we can just keep going That's all day true. with this. No problem. Yeah, if you notice, there's no spitting required in this, uh, yeah. in this tasting Makes session. it a lot neater as well. <laughs> all right, so the last one we're going to do today, this is the Sapiens Red. This is a Tempranillo as well, same as the Rosé. Um, and this is, I think, also coming from Spain, right? Yeah. Now, I look at the color here, and we kind of put it over the white a little bit. And it's a gorgeous color. It's nice and deep, almost a garnet. The, this, yes, I love it already. Like the rose petals are jumping out of the glass. Ooh, we have some tannin with this. So the tannin is that sort of puckery, shrivelly sensation you get on your tongue and your cheeks from a lot of red wines, Cabernets, um, Cabernet right. Sauvignon, right, Tempranillo. Right, right. So now this is very, very um, reminiscent of something like a Rioja, where you're getting that full experience of the tan and, and almost the leathery, those very secondary aromas that okay. are coming out. 
Um, and this is like a charred grilled meat food, uh, wine completely. So I want to come to your place for dinner. <laughs> All of these different pairings, they sound amazing. This would be great with cheese, like manchego, like a dried, hard, cheap right. smoked cheese or something, too. Mm. Fabulous. It's really good. I love it. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, that was a really, I think, a wide selection. And mm -hmm. we'll include the notes on that when we publish the podcast and on YouTube. So thanks yeah. for that. One of the things I want to point out, because I'm watching you do the tastings, mm -hmm. and obviously I've tasted these myself, but not with the discerning palate, there's kind of a an implicit assumption. I just want to make it exquisite for those of you that are listening that are maybe haven't even tried an alcohol-free mm -hmm. wine yet is back to that earlier point. It's not, there is, there's no alcohol. So there is a flavor component that's because of the alcohol that is missing. So when you're tasting, are you already discounting that? Like you're mm -hmm. already thinking you're factoring that out or have you moved to a point where you're, you're tasting it in a different way, almost like that part of your palate has been stopped, shut down and you're right. focusing on other things. And I, those might not even be the right ways to explain it. I'm trying to kind of- I know of, what you're saying. And I think that now that I've had a lot of experience with these, I think the way I initially came at it was the compare and contrast viewpoint of, right. oh, this is not like a typical Cabernet or something, right? But when we think about why do we drink wine in the first place? Okay, maybe, yes. maybe we drink wine yes. to get a buzz, but it, you could also get a buzz by drinking straight vodka, right? So if that was the goal, more effective, you, you would maybe just go for <laughs> the vodka. So what's more important about the wine experience is, you know, the, the whole balance of the wine. So the acidity, the tannin, the sweetness, the aromas, the whole experience, right. and also how that may go with the meal that you're having. Yeah. So when we look at something like this, Okay, the alcohol's not there, but we can get that anywhere. But you're still having the experience of the combination of all the aromas, the tannin that exists in here to sort of clean your palate for the next bite, um, the acid, which makes everything bright. It's an experience, and this is why we drink wine, right? It's not just the alcohol. I love it. So yeah. That's a great I way to describe the, it. think that's the best lens through which to view it. Yeah, and I think the other thing is not forgetting... Um, the absence of things can be a gain, whether it's less calories mm -hmm. or lack of maybe the negative effects of alcohol mm -hmm. beyond a glass or two. So that's really interesting and I think kind of highlights maybe some of the things that get forgotten in the wine uh, experience mm -hmm. because of, of the alcohol component. So mm -hmm. that's really interesting. Yeah. Um, picking on that, picking up on that and then kind of some of the earlier points, we've, we've talked a bit about, you know, alcohol free where it's mm -hmm. been sitting and kind of the trends from very previous generations of one of okay. al the alcoholized mm -hmm. wine or grape juice if you like through to where we are now and mm -hmm. some of the some of the opportunities or even some of the products and 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 uh varieties we're seeing now if you were to look out two years three years five years from a hospitality wine industry sommelier mm -hmm. perspective what are some of the things you you, you might be looking for or expecting the quality to just keep going up. Okay. Okay. So we're going to have much more increased levels of interest in the products. Um, and with that level of interest and with people supporting with their money and buying these products, there's going to be more investment in improving technology. Yes. So we know that the quality is just going to keep improving and we've already seen that start to happen. The generation, you know, Z's that are just I don't know. Are they just hitting 21 now? Like they must just <laughs> be coming up. I don't know. I'm don't supposedly, know I'm Z. supposedly in a, a millennial. I don't really know about that, but, um, you know, the millennials and they're younger than me, they're like something like 20 to 24% aren't even drinking alcohol. I know it's crazy. And You're all a lot younger. That. I'm like Gen <laughs> R or something. So, uh, it's definitely different than when yeah, I was I mean, it's in my a, 20s. It's a completely different thing. So, you know, really people are so much more aware of the benefits of not drinking alcohol, whether it's, you know, a health benefit or your mental clarity or just overall feeling better. And also if not necessarily never drinking, but just cutting back in yeah, general. It's definitely so, that in between know, world yeah. of where it's, it's, you know, it was a much more binary conversation. Right. It still largely yeah. is yes. a lot of yeah. what we're talking about because we live and breathe this stuff mm -hmm. uh, is still very new. If mm -hmm. unheard of mm -hmm. for a vast majority of, um, Americans or North mm -hmm. Americans. Well, that was super fun. I think yes. this is the kind of format where we might 
uh, in a few months when we've got a few new, when I, uh, kind of a new selection mm-hmm. to bring in. Um, have a have you back yes, if you're willing. I will. And, uh, Definitely. Jillian Fontana, thank you yes. so much for coming. Thank Thanks, you for Chris. the tastings. Thank you for your insight and expertise. You're very and welcome. Looking forward to seeing you soon. You too. Thanks, Thanks. everybody. Take care. Well, we hope you enjoyed this episode of Alcohol Free Radio. We'd love to hear from you. Send us a message on social media or through email at hello at betterroads.com. Great to be here with you all together. Take care.